The next day, John called my house, acting like nothing had happened. We're going to make an escape today, and we want to get some real New York food. Where should we go? I knew this was John's way of apologizing. I know just the place, I told him, if you don't mind coming up to Harlem. That night, the Beatles picked us up in a limousine for a feast of ribs and chicken at Sherman's Barbecue in Harlem, and they loved it. After the Ronettes got back from England, Phil and I grew closer than ever. We made love after we listened to Do I Love You for the first time in June of 1964. I used some of my Ronnet money to rent an apartment on Riverside Drive. It was a beautiful place with more than enough room for Estelle, my mother, and me. That night we moved in, I thought back to those hot summer nights when Dad drove us down to Riverside Drive to cool off. I remembered how I used to stare up at all the tall buildings and wonder what kind of people lived in those apartments. I pulled the window open and waved down at all those cars below. Maybe it sounds silly, but I thought there might be some 10-year-old kid looking up from, from their back seat of their daddy's car. And if there was, I wanted to let her know we weren't really all that different up here. The British invasion turned most of the rock and roll acts from the Brooklyn Fox into overnight has-beens. The Ronettes were lucky. 1964 was actually our biggest year ever. Baby I Love You was still on the charts in January, and we had three more songs in the top 40 that year. We probably made more live appearances in 1964 than any other girl group, maybe except the Supremes. <laughs> Even so, I could tell that the pressures were starting to get to Estelle and Nedra. They loved being Ronettes, but they had steady boyfriends and they were already talking about settling down and starting families. I wanted kids too, but show business came first. Even though we were starting to have our differences, our little family squabbles never really grew into anything major. Part of the reason was that I hardly even saw the Ronettes after Phil started recording us. Phil wasn't content to share me with anyone, not even my own family. For some reason, Phil's jealousy seemed to get worse whenever we got to California. I found that out when I made the mistake of going out to get a hamburger with Sonny Bono. I was at Gold Star with Nedger at one night and I was starving. Phil was busy in the mixing booth and nothing else seemed to be going on. So Nedger and I jumped in the car with Sonny and went out for hamburgers. But all the music stands had been knocked over and there were pieces of broken glass everywhere. A long thin ribbon of recording tape stretched the length of the room at our feet. Our feet made a squishing sound when we walked on spots where the carpet was wet from the entire pot of coffee. Phil was waiting for us in the hallway. Where the fuck have you girls been, Phil shouted. Nedra and I just stood there staring at the veins throbbing up and down his head. Too scared to say a word. It was my fault, Phil, Sonny explained. I just took the girls out to get something to eat. You're damn right it was your fault, he said to Sonny. You should know better. Then he turned back to me, and you should know better than to leave here without telling me. It wasn't just men Phil was jealous of. He didn't like to share me with anyone, share included. One time she found me sitting alone in my hotel room waiting for Phil to come back from the studio. Honey, I know you're in love with the guy, she told me, but nobody can blame you for playing hooky every once in a while. Let's get out of here. But Phil likes me here when he gets back from the studio. I tried to explain. I shouldn't have bothered. It's impossible to argue with Cher about anything. We went to the Purple Onion, a big dance club, and we hit the dance floor. We ran into Darling Love, and we danced for hours. It was great until Phil found me. He was so pissed that he walked right onto the dance floor and dragged me off. You might wonder how I could stay with a boyfriend who treated me that way. But Phil wasn't always like that. There were times when I could tell he absolutely idolized me. He could be so sweet when we were alone that I'd completely forget all his horrible moods. I'd close my eyes and think of all the good things that had happened since I met Phil. One by one, he made all my dreams come true. Darling Love finally told me Phil's best kept secret. It happened in the spring of 1964. I was doing background vocals at Gold Star that afternoon with Darlene and some of the other singers when Phil's mom dropped by for a visit. Bertha Spector was a tiny woman and very protective of her son. She used to walk right into the studio no matter what was going on. Some days she even brought a bowl of chicken soup for Phil, which he hated. <laughs> we were on a break from recording when the studio watchman buzzed Phil 
from the front door to warn him that his mom was on the way back with her tray of soup. I asked Darlene if she didn't think Phil looked cute when his mom handed him his soup spoon. Not the way you do, girl, she said. I was quiet for a long time until I finally decided to confess my deepest fantasy. I'm in love, and one day I'm going to marry that man. Darlene just shook her head and said, I don't think so. Why not, I demanded. Well, she sighed. You're going to have to find out sometime. She looked around for a more private spot, which didn't exist at Gold Star. Then she pointed to the ladies' room. Come on, she said, in there. I walked into the ladies' room and took my usual place at the sink, right in front of the big mirror. Then Darlene blurted it out. Honey, this guy is married. I leaned forward and began throwing my guts up all over the sink. Darlene had no idea I would be so startled by her little revelation, but I was in shock. Who is it? I asked her. Give me a name. Give me a face. I couldn't understand how this wife could have avoided me all this time. I've never met her. Not many people have, Darlene told me. Her name is Annette. But Phil never talks about her. I don't think he even sees her anymore. Phil had kept it so well hidden, but I knew that everyone who worked for him must have known about her. But none of them even bothered to tell me. Suddenly I felt betrayed and completely alone. I felt terrible for a few days, like somebody had died. But my strategy for getting past the grief was to pretend nothing had happened. I also had my career to think about. It's not like Phil was just an unfaithful lover. He was also my producer, and for a girl singing in the 60s, your producer was your lifeline. If I said bye-bye to Phil, I would have been saying bye-bye to my career. I had a sister and a cousin and a lot of other relatives depending on me for a living so I pretended I'd never heard of Phil's wife, and I was good at it. After a few days, I had myself convinced that nothing had really changed between me and Phil, and by that time, most of the pain had passed. I'm tired of paying for hotel rooms, Phil announced one afternoon as we got into his roles after a recording session at Gold Star. Maybe we should get a house. I thought he must be joking. I'd love that. When can we start looking? Why not today, he asked, with a little smile. Then he told George Brandt, the chauffeur, let's go see if we can't find a house, George. He had the whole thing set up because George knew exactly where he was going. He came to a narrow little street called Lockalina Road. George parked the car in front of a big house with a fountain out front. I was trying to play it cool, but it isn't every day that the love of your life asks you to settle down with him. And if Phil wanted me to live with him, could marriage be far off? By 1965, the Ronettes were on the way out. We had only two songs even break into the top 100 that year. Even after the Ronettes slump began in 1965, I didn't get too concerned. Phil had just scored the biggest smash of his career with You've Lost That Loving Feeling by the Righteous Brothers. I figured it was just a matter of time before he turned his attention back to my career. If 1965 was a slow year for the Ronettes' recording career, 1966 was like death. We only had one record out the whole year, and that one barely got on the Billboard chart at number 100. It stayed there exactly one week, but I never gave up hope. Phil still brought me into the studio every few months to record a new Ronette song, sometimes alone, sometimes with Nedra and Estelle. But then he just followed away with the other unreleased songs. After a while, I started to wonder why he even bothered having me come down to the studio. Phil's perfectionism was ruining every artist on his label. Every time he made a record, he'd find some flaw that nobody else could hear, and he refused to put it out. And if he released a song that didn't make it to the top of the charts, he'd get depressed for months. One record flopped so bad, it actually sent him into retirement. River Deep Mountain High was a song that Phil recorded with Tina Turner in March of 1966. It was a great record. Phil captured the rawness in Tina's voice and made it a part of his wall of sound. And the result was tremendous. It should have been one of Phil's biggest hits, but it turned out to be his biggest failure. He did everything he could to push River Deep Mountain High, but the American DJs just wouldn't play it. It was a huge hit in England, but in this country it barely got on the charts. Phil was so depressed, he didn't go near the studio for months. He just moped around his mansion playing pool all day. Thank God I still had my live shows with the Ronettes to take my mind off of Phil's depressions. 
Even without a recent hit, we were still popular enough to get a booking at Manhattan's Basin Street East, a classy nightclub that was just starting to book rock and roll acts. We opened there in July of 66. We did a great show and the crowd loved us. But it's not what happened on stage that sticks in my mind. I was sitting in our dressing room backstage when one of the waiters came back and told me that there was a lady out front who wanted to talk to me. I asked him who it was. She didn't say, he told me. She just said to tell you she's a good friend of Phil's. I was curious, so I followed the waiter out to a table in front where this pretty young blonde woman was sitting with a guy in a suit. The waiter pulled a chair out for me, and the woman stood up and held out her hand. I'm Annette Spector, she said, shaking my hand. I've heard so much about you. At first, I didn't even realize who she was. Then she said, I wanted to introduce myself and let you know there are no hard feelings. That's when I figured it out. Annette had been divorced from Phil for about six months, so I thought it was nice of her to make an effort to meet me. Even so, I couldn't think of a single word to say to her, which is too bad because looking back, I bet we could have had one hell of a conversation. Richard Pryor was our opening act that night but he was still a young unknown then, and I honestly don't remember much about his act. In fact, I don't remember much about our show that night either. A few nights later, our tour manager told us he had some important news. The Beatles are doing a tour of the U.S. next month. They want to know if the Ronettes are available to be in the opening act on the U.S. tour. Opening for the Beatles tour was probably the greatest thing that could have happened to any group in the 60s. That's what finally got the Ronettes on the cover of Ebony magazine. I couldn't wait to tell Phil, so I called him in California as soon as I got home that night. But all Phil could say was, hmm. <laughs> What's wrong, Phil, I asked. Nothing's wrong, he said. But he obviously had something on his mind. We can talk more after you get back out here. When I got out to California, neither of us mentioned it until Phil took me down to Gold Star. And that was a surprise because I knew Phil hadn't been to the recording studio in months. I followed him down to the storage office and watched as he started shuffling through a few boxes of old recording tapes. He still hadn't said a word when Larry Levine poked his head in to say hello. They made a little small talk and I was just starting to get bored when Phil revealed what this whole game of going down to Gold Star was all about. Oh, by the way, Larry, he said, trying to sound casual, can you see about booking us some studio time in August? I'd like to get started on Ronnie's next record. Larry said he'd look into it, and then he left. But Phil, I said, I'm supposed to be on tour with the Beatles in August. Ronnie, he said, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to do another tour, or do you want to go back into the studio and make another hit? But Phil, this isn't just any tour. This is the Beatles. That's even more reason to skip it. Nobody's coming to those shows to see you. Those concerts are nothing but freak shows. Ask the Beatles. They'll be the first to admit it. But do what you want. It's your career. Then I watched as Phil flipped through the same box of tapes for the third time. That's when I saw his hands were shaking. Obviously, something about this tour was upsetting Phil. So much he couldn't even talk about it. And I had a pretty good idea what it was, or who. His name was John Lennon. And I'll tell you something else, he continued, looking me straight in the eye. I'm not going to stick around and watch you throw your career away doing live shows for the rest of your life. If you want to make records, fine. I'll be here for you. If you don't, that's fine, too. Just don't expect anything else from me. His voice cracked a little as he said that last part, and that's when I saw how afraid he was that I might go off with the Beatles and leave him behind. Phil had made an ultimatum, them or me. That might have sounded harsh to someone else, but to me it was a declaration of his love. The guy wanted me all or nothing at all. The Ronettes did go on tour with the Beatles, but my cousin Elaine stood in my place. Phil was still bummed out over the failure of River Deep Mountain High, and he'd lock himself away in his second floor study for days on end, only coming out to eat or sleep. But what really put Phil under was the news that his friend Lenny Bruce had died of a drug overdose. Phil loved Lenny's sick sense of humor, and the two of them hung out together all the time. Phil worshipped the guy. He hung a giant picture of Lenny right over our bed. Phil never told me that Lenny had died. I found it out by accident one night when I couldn't sleep. Phil had been locked up in his study most of the evening. But I happened to be wandering past when he finally opened the door. When I looked at him, I couldn't help but notice that his eyes were all red, 
like he'd been crying. What's wrong, Phil? I asked. Nothing, he said, trying to act normal. What are you doing still up? I don't know, I said. I just couldn't sleep. Well, go back to bed, he commanded. Then his mood changed, and he spoke a little softer. I'll bring you in a snack. Phil loved to make me grilled cheese and tomato sandwiches late at night. Phil headed downstairs to the kitchen. I started back toward our bedroom, but when I noticed that Phil had left the door to his study open, I couldn't resist tiptoeing in for a little peek. I wasn't allowed in there, but I thought I'd just slip in and try to find something to read. Phil never let me have magazines in the house, but I thought he might have a copy of Cashbox lying around. There weren't any magazines in plain sight, so I pulled open the top drawer of his desk. The only thing in there was a small stack of black and white photographs. I picked one up out of curiosity, but I wished I hadn't as soon as I saw it. I picked one up out of curiosity. There were photos of Lenny Bruce dead. He was lying naked in front of a toilet. He had gotten really fat, and his stomach was bloated. I noticed a hypodermic needle lying on the floor next to Lenny's body. I sat down in Phil's chair and studied the pictures one by one. I was still sitting like that when I felt something small and flat go whizzing past my head. It bounced off the wall and down onto the floor before I recognized it was half of my sandwich. I looked up in terror to see Phil standing in the doorway. He was about to throw the other half of the sandwich at me, but he tossed it straight to the floor instead, plate and all. He looked so pissed that I was sure he was finally going to hit me. But all he did was rip the photos out of my hand. He turned his back to me and tossed the pictures into the drawer where I'd found them. I finally found the nerve to speak. Phil, I said, you never told me about Lenny. What happened? Then came the yelling. I don't fucking believe you. You break into my private area. You snoop around in materials of a highly personal nature. And then you have the nerve to stand there asking me questions that are none of your goddamn business? I knew there was no talking to Phil when he started shouting, so I walked into the bathroom. Phil locked himself back into his study, and I didn't see him again for the rest of the night. In the fall of 1966, the Ronettes left for an extended tour that included a series of concerts at U.S. Army bases in Germany. It turned out to be the Ronettes' last tour. Phil hadn't recorded us in months, and the other two Ronettes were getting sick of waiting for him. Nedra made plans to marry and start her own family as soon as we got back from Germany, and Estelle was just as anxious to settle down with her boyfriend. By the start of 1967, I was spending more time at the mansion than I was at home in New York. My mother thought I was living in hotel rooms when I went out to California. I mentioned it to Phil one night. I'm afraid to call my mom, I explained, because if I do that, she'll ask me where I'm staying, and I can't lie to her. But if I tell her the truth, I don't think she'll like it. Don't worry, Phil told me, picking up the phone. <laughs> All you have to do is tell her we got married last weekend. He dialed my mother's number and spoke directly into the phone. I've got some great news, Mrs. Bennett. Your daughter and I were married last week. I knew she didn't buy it for a second. She started asking him all kinds of questions, and the more answers he gave, the more incredible his story grew. <laughs> the service was performed by two practicing rabbis, he said. There were no witnesses. There was an obscure Hebraic ceremony, very ancient. After hearing that, my mother insisted that Phil put me on the line. What is this story Phil's telling me about two ancient Hebrews, she asked. I just told her it's true, Mom. Phil and I really did get married last week. You did, did you? She said. Well, I guess I'm going to have to come out there myself to see about this marriage. And you'd better hope it's for real. Because if it's not, I'm going to carry you right back to New York. I didn't raise no daughter of mine to live with no man. It was all a game to Phil. A hundred dollars says that when your mother sees the way you're living, she won't care whether we're married or not. I could tell Mom was going to be troubled the minute she climbed out of the limousine. The first thing she said to me was, where's the ring? She only had to look in my eyes to know that I'd been lying the whole time. Just then Phil walked down the stairs. Hello, Mrs. Bennett, he said. I don't see no ring on my daughter's hand, Phil. We're having one specially designed, he started to say but she was no longer listening. Stop your damn lying, Phil, she said. No two Hebrews married you and Ronnie. You're just using her and you know you're not supposed to do that.
Now get out of my way because I'm carrying my daughter out of here tonight. She turned to me. Go upstairs and get whatever clothes you need because I'm calling a taxi right now. Mom decided to hide me out at different relatives' houses all over Harlem. The plan was to keep me hopping so Phil wouldn't be able to track me down. After a few days of that, I started going crazy. I spent my days sitting around an aunt's house watching TV. A lot of my cousins and other relatives were drinkers, so after a while I started drinking with them. Once I started drinking, I stopped caring about how I looked. I wore the same clothes day after day, and I didn't bother combing my hair anymore. None of my relatives even noticed. They treated me like a little freak to begin with. I was the old, odd little cousin from Beverly Hills. All they wanted to do was brag about how they were planning to snag my millionaire by hiding me out until he married me. Not once did anyone ever talk about Phil without mentioning money in the same breath. Things were getting so bad with my relatives that I thanked God when Phil showed up to rescue me. He came to Spanish Harlem in the back of a long black limousine. He stopped at my mom's apartment first, but when he didn't find me there, he drove to my old neighborhood and parked in front of my Aunt Hermine's house. Every kid in the neighborhood came out to the curb to take a peek at his car. Phil rolled down the window when he recognized my cousin Ira. Come here, Ira, Phil said. I'm trying to find Ronnie. I'm not supposed to tell you where she is, Ira told him. But I know Ronnie would want to see me, he said. Ira finally gave in. I was asleep on my cousin Elaine's bed when he brought Phil to the door. My Aunt Hermine refused to let Phil in the house, but I could hear him shouting all the way in the bedroom. Ronnie, he called. Are you in there? I stumbled out of bed, not sure if I was dreaming or awake. But when I saw Phil standing there at the doorway, I sure hoped he was real. I felt like a complete wreck in my wrinkled shirt, with my hair going every which way. But Phil gawked at me like I was Jacqueline Kennedy. Oh, baby, he said, I've missed you. In that moment, I fell in love all over again. Phil installed an intercom in every room of the mansion, including the bathrooms. By the beginning of 1968, Phil and I almost never left the house anymore. The only girlfriend I had was a lady named Bobby Golson. The only other woman I ever saw was Phil's secretary, Gloria Domino. After Phil stopped going to his office on Sunset Boulevard, Gloria became his only real contact with the outside world. She'd drive from the office every afternoon with messages, contracts, or checks for him to sign. One day, Gloria and I were driving back from a shopping trip when we drove past Phil Spector Productions. I happened to mention that I'd never been inside. Gloria pulled into a parking spot. It was already after 6 o'clock, but she still walked into the offices first, just to make sure no one was around. Come on, she giggled. The coast is clear. Gloria went into her office to do some work and left me to wander around on my own. I walked past the reception area and flipped on the light in Phil's private office. I gazed around his office in amazement. Every square inch of wall was plastered with pictures of me. I stood there looking at the girl in those pictures, and it seemed like they were taken a lifetime ago. Whatever happened to that happy, energetic little girl who spent all her time singing and having fun? I sure wasn't her. I was so depressed that I finally just started sobbing. When Gloria dropped me off at the mansion that night, I walked into the hallway, dark as always, and felt so lonely I almost started crying all over again. After about an hour, Phil came to bed. He climbed in next to me and started rubbing my shoulders. I was in no mood to have sex, so I stiffened my body and refused to give in. That confused the hell out of him, and he tossed himself back on his side of the bed in exaggerated frustration. We lay there for a good two or three minutes before I got up the nerve to speak. I want to go back to New York. What for, he said, getting annoyed. I thought we scheduled your trip home for next month. I'm not talking about a visit. I mean to stay. I miss my family. I spoke with such determination that I think I surprised him because he didn't once try to interrupt me. I love you, Phil, I continued. You know I do, but I can't keep on going like this. Everything's always so quiet here. Sometimes I get so lonely I feel like I'm going to crack up. I need that noise, Phil. I need to be part of a family. Phil was quiet after that. I had gotten the last word in with Phil Spector, and that didn't happen very often. The next day was hell. I just knew Phil would want nothing else to do with me, and that put me into a panic. All I had was Phil, and the thought of losing him made me want to hold on to him more than anything else in the world. 
I sat down at the top of the stairs and waited for him to come out of his study. I was ready to apologize and promise I would never leave him if only he'd take me back. After what seemed like hours, Phil opened his door and saw me sitting there. You think your mother's home? I guess. Why? He walked toward the kitchen. Let's give her a call. I want to invite her out here for the wedding. Whose wedding, I asked, like I didn't know what he was talking about. It's funny how quickly your feelings can change. A day before, I had just about given up all hope. But that was before I heard Phil saying, Our wedding, yours and mine. Phil and I planned to get married in a small ceremony in Beverly Hills on April 14, 1968. I hardly remember the ceremony itself. It was held in an office in Beverly Hills City Hall. A justice of the peace married us, but I don't remember much else about it except that we were supposed to say I do, we did, and after that we really were man and wife. We celebrated our wedding night at a Mahalia Jackson concert. Guess whose idea that was? Phil bought tickets for the entire wedding party, and he was in heaven the whole time. But something mysterious happened to Phil's high spirits as soon as we left the show. Phil asked me if I would take my mom home without him. I'm going to my mother's house. I felt like I had just been stung by a bee. Here it was my wedding night, and my husband was on his way to his mother's house. Oh, Phil, I asked him, why is it so important for you to go over there tonight? Because, he confessed, I haven't told her I got married. When we got in the house, I kissed my mother goodnight and went to my bedroom to get ready for my wedding night. I put on a sheer nightgown that I bought especially for this occasion. It was over two hours before Phil came back from his mother's house. Slamming the door behind him, he was a completely different person than the man I had sat with at the concert three hours earlier. You bitch, he shouted. I couldn't believe how mad he looked. Worse than I'd ever seen him. He was raving so loud that the veins in his neck were bulging blue. I know your game, Veronica, he shouted. You just want my money. That is it, isn't it? I was so scared that I got up and ran out of the bedroom and into the hallway. If Phil was going to kill me, I wanted him to do it where there might be witnesses. What's wrong, Phil? What did your mother tell you? The truth, he panted that this whole marriage is about one thing, my money. He was so mad he could hardly catch his breath now. Everyone told me to have a prenuptial agreement drawn up, but I didn't, and do you know why? Because I'm a romantic, he cried. But now he was pacing up and down the hallway, running out of steam. <laughs> he finally plopped down in one of the antique French armchairs that no one ever sat in. I saw my mother standing at the other end of the hall. I ran over to her. When Phil caught sight of my mother, he jumped up from his chair and ran into his study, slamming the door behind him. Mom shook her head and looked over to me. We better go downstairs. I think that boy's on dope. We ran into the guest apartment and locked the door behind us. I know if Phil was on dope, I said, wouldn't I? Not if he's taking cocaine. When someone uses that stuff, you can't see or smell it. I was amazed at how much my mother knew about these substances. But my lesson in drug abuse got cut short when Phil started banging on her door. Open up, Mrs. Bennett, he called out. Not until you start acting like a grown man, Phil, she answered. To hell with you, he shouted, and he was gone. Mom and I moved over to the couch while I tried to catch my breath. Just as I started to relax, we heard the jangling of keys outside the door. Thank God he had to try a few of them before he found the right ones, because that gave us time to lock ourselves in the bathroom. A few seconds later, we heard him shouting through the bathroom door from inside the apartment. Cut this shit, Mrs. Bennett. You've got my wife in there, and I have a right to see her. She was my daughter before she was your wife. Mom yelled back, so you ain't got no rights. He didn't say anything else. Instead, he started pounding on the door in a steady rhythm. Boom, boom. My mother just sat calmly on the toilet seat while I lay shaking on the floor, scared to death of what might happen if the door opened. Phil had stopped yelling, but it wasn't the shouting that had made me scared. I heard him shout like that a thousand times, but I'd never seen him looking quite so mad with saliva dripping down the side of his mouth and his eyes bulging out like a wild coyote's. He'd look like someone you'd see in a movie about insane people. The morning after my wedding night, I woke up to the sound of a pile driver in the front yard. I walked over to the window and peeked through the curtains. That's when I saw about half dozen men putting up big ten-foot poles all around the edges of the yard. 
I glanced over to the truck where I saw six other guys unrolling barbed wire and chain link. They were obviously building some kind of fence. I grabbed my mother's robe and headed upstairs to my bedroom, praying that Phil wouldn't be in there. But there were a dozen roses on my pillow and an apology written in Phil's handwriting. My only household duty was to get up in the morning and discuss with George what Phil and I wanted for dinner. After that, I'd go out to the pool and watch Phil do his laps. I never learned how to swim, so I'd just splash around in the shallow end. Then I'd go back into the house and watch other people do my housework. I felt so bored and useless that after a while I'd go into the TV room and watch old Betty Davis movies. And that didn't exactly cheer me up. Phil had a liquor cabinet in his downstairs game room. It was hidden away in the wall behind the fireplace, but I discovered it by accident one night when he was out. I was poking around the game room when I saw this little button hidden away in the back of a thick wooden pillar. Naturally, I pushed it. Out of nowhere, this antique bar swung down like something out of an old mystery movie. Of all the things that seemed to go wrong during the first year of marriage, I think the thing that depressed me worst of all was that I couldn't get pregnant. I went to ten different doctors. I saw specialists in America, England, and Europe. It never even occurred to me that the problem might be with Phil. Of course, he never considered going in for an examination. None of the doctors suggested it might be a low sperm count on Phil's part. The worst part about not being able to have kids was that this was the one area where Phil and I agreed completely. He wanted children as badly as I did. I never could get used to the life of a recluse. The only time I got out was when Phil let George Brandt and one of the other servants drive me to my friend Bobby Golson's house. I was starting to feel like a prisoner. Phil finally surprised me with a car of my own for my 25th birthday in 1968. It was a Camaro, orange and white. Phil had it monogrammed in about 23 places. Phil wanted to be like Orson Welles in Citizen Kane. That was his favorite movie, and he used to show it over and over again. Watching that film didn't do a whole lot for my self-confidence. I mean, the guy in the movie was so in love with this girl that he buys her coaches and mansions and even builds her, her an opera house for her very own. But after all that, he still can't make her a good singer. I began to wonder if Phil was trying to tell me something. On nights when Phil didn't want to watch a movie, he'd lock himself in his study. Once he closed that door, I'd sneak downstairs and pour myself a beaker of scotch. Then I'd smuggle it up to the TV room where I'd, where I'd drink along with Betty Davis on the late, late show. I'd go on one of these drinking sprees about um, once every three or four weeks. I figured I was taking such a small amount of liquor that Phil would never miss it, but I was wrong. I was in the kitchen with George Johnson one afternoon when Phil stormed in carrying a half-empty bottle of scotch. George, he shouted, slamming the bottle down on the counter. Looks like your pal Bill found my liquor cabinet. Bill was a down-on-his-luck guy who came in twice a week to do the dusting. Phil knew the guy had a drinking problem, but he'd hired him anyway because he was a friend of George's. I blurted out the truth. Bill didn't drink that stuff. I told him I did. Phil was so shocked by what he just heard that he stood there dumbstruck. The next morning, he stuck a big gray padlock on the cabinet. But you can't stop someone from drinking by locking up the liquor. That just forces them to be more clever. And I was. Every few weeks, I'd make up a craving for something we didn't have in the house. Then Phil would let me drive down the hill to Carl's Market to pick some up. Once I got there, I'd stand at the magazine rack for half an hour or so, reading all the magazines that Phil wouldn't let me have in the house. Then I'd go into the liquor department. When I hear some of the stories that, that go around about my marriage to Phil, I'm amazed. Everybody assumes he must have beat me all the time to keep me there in the mansion with him, but he never laid a hand on me. Psychological torture was his specialty. Name-calling, shouting, cursing, those kinds of things. The one time I did get hurt, it was from trying to get away from him. It was the day before he was supposed to leave on a business trip to Philadelphia. And I had made plans to visit my family in New York while he was gone. For some reason, he didn't want me to leave town while he was away. Why must you always defy me, he shouted in my face. I got scared and took a step backwards. I didn't have a strong foothold, and I lost my balance and went tumbling down the stairs. Phil insisted we go straight to the doctor. The doctor agreed with me that it was probably just a minor sprain, but then he walked into the next room to 
to have a little talk with Phil and came back and announced that he was going to put my leg in a cast. Phil went to Philadelphia the next day, but before he left, he hired a nurse to watch over me. This woman put me in a wheelchair and stared over my shoulder day and night. She was worse than Phil. And every couple of hours, she'd bring me a little red pills and a glass of water. What are these pills for, I'd ask her. They'll help you with the pain, she said. I took them, but all they did was make me sleepy. The best thing about having Phil out of town was that I could have Bobby Colson up to the house for lunch. When Bobby asked me about my broken leg, I told her the whole story. When I told her the nurse was giving me pills, she stopped me. You want to be careful with this stuff, Ronnie. My God, I had no idea things had gotten this bad. What do you mean? You don't see it? This full cast, the wheelchair, that nurse? Phil's worked this whole thing out so that you'll remain a prisoner in his house even though he's away. After Bobby went home, I couldn't stop thinking about all that stuff, she said. Maybe the nurse was nothing more than my hard keeper. But if she was, I wasn't going to play along and make her job any easier. I'm going for a ride, I announced, alone. Of course, I had no idea where I was going, so I just drove. I finally ended up on Santa Monica Boulevard, which is where I saw Vinnie Poncia, one of my old songwriters. He was walking on the sidewalk, so I honked my horn and pulled over to say hello. Vinnie and his wife were staying at a motel nearby. I was there maybe a, maybe a half hour, just long enough to have a couple of drinks and make some small talk. Then I said goodbye and limped back out to my car. All of a sudden, I felt really dizzy. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to mix pills and alcohol. By the time I got down to the street, I could barely stand up. I dropped the crutches and lay down on the sidewalk. It was scary. I wasn't just drunk. I'd been smashed often enough to know that this was something different. Then slowly my body started shaking. All of a sudden I felt like I was losing control of my arms. They started jerking around on their own and I couldn't do a thing to stop them. A few seconds later my entire body doubled up and began twisting itself in painful contortions that I had no control over. Finally my eyes rolled way back into my head and I passed out. I had just had my first seizure. I don't know how long I was out. The experience had scared the shit out of me. But I decided not to tell anyone about it. Phil was still out of town, and what he didn't know couldn't hurt me. In January, Phil announced that we were going back into the studio to make my first new record in almost three years. He had a brand new song for me, You Came, You Saw, You Conquered. It came out in March of 1969, but it flopped so badly that Phil might as well have left it on the shelf with all the other unreleased songs. I wasn't even disappointed when it bombed. By now, my confidence was so low that I just accepted the record's failure as further proof that I wasn't a singer anymore. Once I'd given up my dream of singing again, I had nowhere to go but down. I'd sit in the TV room all day with my soap operas and Manischewitz. I started to wonder what I was really living for anyway. I was only 25 years old, but I wasn't even sure who I was anymore. The identity I chose for myself was a mother. I'd always loved kids, and I desperately needed a family. I knew I'd make a great mom. All I needed was a kid, and I found him, believe it or not, watching television. I was watching this documentary about unwanted babies on TV when the host held up this tiny baby boy. He was only a few days old with smooth brown skin and the waviest black hair I'd ever seen on a baby. He was a half-breed like me, and he was beautiful. He looked like what I'd always imagined our child would look like. I took it as a sign from God. I was going to be a mother, and I couldn't wait. Phil was just as excited as I was about adopting a baby. I think we both felt that having kids would bring us closer together. So we went crazy waiting to hear if we'd been approved for adoption. We even picked out a name for him, Dante. The day we went to pick up Dante was probably the only truly happy day of our entire marriage. When we walked out of the adoption agency with our brand new baby in his blanket, we were just like any other happily married couple. We spent the rest of that afternoon feeding and fussing over Dante, just like any other normal parent. I loved it. For a few hours, I was sure that things were really starting to change between Phil and me, now that we had our little family. But the fantasy lasted about one day. I was playing with Dante in the nursery when George Johnson brought this old lady in. She was carrying a big bag filled with diapers and toys. 
This must be Dante, she said, and you must be the new mommy. Yeah, I said, and who are you? I'm Mrs. Taylor, she said. Didn't your husband tell you? He hired me to watch the baby. And this lady wasn't kidding. She checked Dante's diapers and had already started changing his sheets before she finished her sentence. Much as he hated to go out, Phil always made it a point to celebrate my birthday. In 1969, Phil flew me to Las Vegas to see Elvis Presley for my 26th birthday. When Elvis invited us backstage afterward, Phil left me stranded in the hallway with his bodyguard while he pushed his way through the crowd to see Elvis. I was trying to peek through a crack in the dressing room door when this beautiful young girl pops out and nearly smashes the door in my face. I didn't recognize her at first, but when I saw she was the only girl there wearing even more mascara than I was, I knew she had to be Priscilla Presley. Oh, hi, she said, talking like we were old friends. What are you doing out here? Come on in. Elvis is dying to meet you. She grabbed my hand and led me through the crowd. I could tell she was shy, but Priscilla didn't seem to have any trouble talking to me. You know, she said, I have to tell you, I've always loved the way you look. You are really pretty. Oh, thank you, I said. I was really touched. I don't know why she was so sweet to me, but I've never forgotten it. Priscilla dragged me right up past Phil to Elvis. I'm pleased to meet you, he said. And that was about all I heard before Phil grabbed my arm and started dragging me away. I guess Elvis had looked at me a second or two longer than Phil thought was proper. Why don't you and George go back to the hotel room and wait for me, he asked after we got back to the hallway. He pulled out a big roll of hundred dollar bills and handed five of them to George Brandt. Here, George, he said, take her through the casino and let her play anything she wants. But what girl wants to celebrate her 26th birthday playing craps with her bodyguard? I told George to drop me off at my room. I got sick of waiting for Phil and call room service. The bellboy brought up six Pepsis and a bottle of vodka. If I had to spend my birthday alone in my room, I was sure as hell going to have a celebration. Phil finally tiptoed in about 5 a.m. only to find me passed out in front of the TV. By this time, he knew I'd like to drink when I got depressed, but I don't think he'd ever actually seen me drunk before, and it scared him. Phil thought he could manage my alcohol problem by tightening his control over me, even though that was one of the things that made me drink in the first place. I practically had to kill myself in the Camaro before he or I understood how serious my problem was. I was driving back from Bobby Dolson's house the night I had my accident. I often had a couple of drinks with Bobby, but I was really getting carried away this time, and she knew it. Ronnie, she asked, what are you trying to do to yourself? That's just what he wants. Every time you drink like this, you lose a little more control. I couldn't deal with the truth, so I turned on her. Why doesn't everyone just mind their own damn business and leave me and Phil the hell alone, I demanded. Then I grabbed my keys and stormed out to my car. I revved the Camaro up and tore out onto the road. I woke up in a strange house with three hippies and Phil standing over me. You're a very lucky girl, Veronica, Phil said. You'll see what I mean when you get a look at your car. End of side two.